Good Friday morning, everybody. We're looking forward to some Division II baseball this weekend. And there are some massive matchups, Robert, coming up. He's Robert Fry. I'm Will Connerly. And we're excited not only to bring you content as we do every day on DIVII social media channel, Robert, as this is a part of that, but also break down some massive series coming up this weekend. We selected a dozen that we're going to break down in depth. There's a dozen more that we're also keeping an eye on. And shoot, it's Division II baseball. We're keeping an eye on all of it. You can bet your bottom dollar that, Robert. But without further ado, Robert, first of all, I know you're excited for all these series. There's some massive ones. We'll kind of go back and forth with a handful of the ones we're looking forward to getting into. But, man, I know you've got a couple of dandies up your sleeve. And same here that we're excited to get into. Yeah, you got that right. Well, we are excited to get into it. We have 12. We both went back and forth. We each picked six. And there's there's a lot we like here. And so I'm going to go in alphabetical order by conference. And there's going to be a few conferences represented here on my end. But we're going to start in the Great American Conference. And we're going to start with Arkansas Tech, who's 14 and 10, 7 and 5 in the Great American Conference, against Oklahoma Northwestern Oklahoma State who is 16 and eight and eight and four in the great American conference, Northwestern Oklahoma state currently third and Arkansas tech currently tied for fifth or excuse me, tied for fourth. Um, and this series will be in a Alva, Oklahoma at glass family field at Meyer stadium. We have a, and these times are subject to change, but we have a single on Friday at 6 PM and a doubleheader Saturday at one and 4 PM central time. So a little bit about Arkansas tech. So, they're a little bit of a struggle on the road. They're two and eight so far on the road, but really interesting to see how this offense performs. You know, they're they're struggling at two fifty six, but I feel like they're they're a better hitting team than what they're leading on right now. Logan Schwenke is the leader of this Wonder Boy offense. He leads in just about every category on the team. He's hitting three forty nine, five oh six OBP and a seven sixty two slugging. Leads in extra base hits with thirteen. He has six doubles, six home runs, twenty one RBIs, also leading the team. They're third, and then on the pitching side, they're third in the conference, in the Great American Conference, with a strikeout rate at 23.4% and at ERA, which is a 4-4-4. Grant Shahan should be a key cog out of that bullpen in this series. His 30.8% K rate and 2.10 ERA make him worthy, potentially, of a few appearances as he's thrown nearly 20 innings. Mason Griffin also should make headway out of the bullpen. He struck out 47% percent of his batters out of the bullpen and just 10 and a third and on the flip side we have northwestern oklahoma state they're 13 and three at home carson wright leads his ranger offense with a 395 batting average and has 14 extra base hits leading the team which and he's tied for first and home runs with seven higgin barcella leads the team in rbis with 25 colby grace is the guy that's tied with carson wright with seven home runs and Grace and Wright are both top five in the Great American Conference in home runs. And this will be an exciting matchup. Uh, Northwestern Oklahoma State is has a 976 fielding percentage, which is seven, 17th in the country, first in the Great American Conference. And, you know, the, the pitching staff of Arkansas Tech, can they hold down these Northwestern Oklahoma State bats? And can this Arkansas Tech lineup pick up? Be interesting to see because I think I think Arkansas Tech can really make some noise here this weekend in the Great American Conference. Yeah, and I think some things could get shaken up in the Great American Conference this weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. A handful of series that we're looking forward to. And this particular one, when you bring it up, both of these teams, uh, they feel, I mean, at the end of the day, it was kind of shocking what happened in this conference, right? This past week with Southern Arkansas dropping a pair of games. And so with Southern Arkansas, Monticello, and then obviously Northwestern and Southwestern Oklahoma States right up at the top with Tech, um, it, it's going to be in Harding in there as well, along with Henderson State with the Reddies doing well stuff. But, I mean, shoot, it's going to be good. It's going to be good to see. Uh, that's going to be a battle atop this league, and, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to it 100%, Robert. One series that I'm really looking forward to as well, it comes out of Conference Carolina's and it's North Greenville and UNC Pembroke, the number two ranked team in the country, according to D2 Baseball Insider. 
um, but not just us. A lot of people think highly of this team. And then also UNC Pembroke, we have them ranked 12th right now. North Greenville, 20 and four. They're eight and one in conference play. They've dominated. While Pembroke, five and four. They're 18 and five overall, but a top 12 battle in. Maybe the most intriguing series this weekend, all in all. It's going to be Friday and Saturday for a three-game set. Pembroke is the host at Sammy Cox Field. And UNG, they swept UNCP last season in Tigerville. And they're coming off a series win against nationally ranked Mount Olive. And for Pembroke, they're coming off a series loss, dropping two of three against Emmanuel. So they'll try to respond, uh, but they'll try to do that against a very, very good team in North Greenville. That was their just first two losses of the year in Pembroke, North Carolina, where now they're 14-2 and two on the year. And we can't talk about this series without talking about David Lewis, the front runner right now in my eyes for National Player of the Year. I know we're early, but he's top five in the country in home runs, RBI, slugging percentage. He's hitting 463 on the year. He's got 11 homers, 41 RBI uh, through 23 games. Meanwhile, Pembroke's got an offense too, and the offense has lit it up. I mean, they're getting on base 470 as a team right now. That's fourth best in the NCAA. They're scoring about 11 runs a game. So pitchers for North Greenville, like Jake Monroe and Reese Fields and Nate Lamb, those were the three starters last week, and you'd probably expect a lot of the same out of this club. They're going to be challenged. One of the best offenses that they faced for a Pembroke team that gets on base quite a bit, fourth best in the country in scoring and on base percentage. Joey Rezik is hitting 375 on the year. Blake Hinson, he writes an eight-game hit streak into this one, hitting over 500 on the season right now, right at 527 of 54. And they're hitting 355 as a team. OPS above 1,000 as a team as well. So when you look at this series overall, Jake Inman versus Jake Monroe, the potential game one matchup should be a lot of fun and, and interested to see. Obviously, Pembroke's going to need a little bit better starting pitching in their third game. They only got one out from their starter in game three last week, whereas Reese Fields, you know, he's a guy who he went game two last week in a great pitching matchup that I know we detailed on DIVII against Mount Olive. Whenever he throws, though, you know it's going to be a challenge, one of just three players in the country with six wins, and that's more than anybody actively in the NCAA right now. So, And that's across any division. So that's going to be a fun one to watch, obviously, on the Conference Carolinas Digital Network. And Pembroke at home, again, a team 14-2 and two at home, welcoming the number two team in the land. It's a series that we want to watch, and I think this is going to be a really, really fun one to see. Absolutely. Well, it'd be interesting to see how Pembroke bounces back. You know, they they had a series last weekend against Emmanuel at home that they should have won. They dropped two and three, two of three. And, you know, that this is a Pembroke team that has just a stalwart of an offense, like you mentioned, and see how they bounce back. But again, they are playing North Greenville. But, you know, the, the, this is a great conference within of, of talent and teams that are in it. Pembroke, North Greenville, they're going to go at it. And we'll see how those Greenville arms, like you mentioned, perform against the bats of UNCP. But as we continue on to now my next series, we're going to go to the Gulf South Conference. We're going to talk about two teams, one of them now receiving votes in our poll, and that's Lee. And Lee is hosting at Larry Carpenter Stadium at Olympic Field. Auburn Montgomery in a weekend set. And if we haven't mentioned before, again, these dates and times are subject to change. So don't take this as, as final, but the Auburn Montgomery currently 13 and 12, eight and four in the Gulf South Conference. That's fourth. And then Lee U university is 16 and seven. They're six and three in the Gulf South. That puts them second right now. It will be a double header on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Eastern, and then a single on Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern. But we're going to talk a little bit about Auburn Montgomery. They're hitting 295 as a team, have an on-base percentage of 408, so they, they get on base relatively well. They're fielding 962, have an ERA of 527. On offense, they have a couple team leaders hitting above 350. Jackson Saman, who's at 358. Jaron Wright at 356. And then they have two leaders, both with 22 RBI on the season, and that's Casey Clark and Zach Dew. And we should expect Ryan Slayton to make a start as he has a 3.38 ERA and a 1.19 whip in 32 innings and over six starts. But 
On the flip side, Lee, they're winners of four in a row. Brandon Daniels is eighth in the Gulf South Conference rating at 398, seventh in OPS at 1,168, tenth in slugging 659, and OBP at 509, which if you add those together makes that OPS. And he also has the third most runs batted in, in all of the country with 37. And speaking of arms, you know, Lee, again, as a team, they are 23rd in the country in slugging, 513, and 24th in OPS as well. So, but we go over on the flip side and we talk a little bit about pitching. They're second in the Gulf, Gulf South Conference in ERA and strikeout percentage. And that's from their first two starters. Jack Nedro is 5-0 and oh with a 3.64 ERA. He has 39 strikeouts, which is the most in the conference. And he has the eighth best, best ERA in the Gulf South. And don't forget lefty Keegan Gagliardo, who's 2-0 and oh with a 203 ERA. And that puts him second in the conference in ERA. And third in strikeouts with 34, like I mentioned. So Auburn Montgomery has done a great job of putting up to the challenge of teams that are receiving votes as they are currently 5-2 and two against teams that have been receiving votes at the time that they've played them. So it'll be interesting to see how they play on the road again against Lee, who's, you know, firing on a lot of cylinders right now, winning four in a row. Again, Daniels is a key cog in that lineup, and you have a pretty good one-two punch in Nedro and Gagliardo. Yeah, it's going to be a really fun series to watch because when you look at the Gulf South right now, it's a lot of West Florida talk, right? But, Lee right now currently tied with Delta State for second. Auburn Montgomery could jump both of them with a good series upcoming this weekend. So that's something definitely to watch here this weekend. And again, another fantastic series with two teams uh, toward the top of the Gulf South Conference. And we, that's what we've looked at, right? We've looked at all the series across the country. What series matter? What series have good teams versus good teams? What series are teams towards the top in the conference versus each other? And, well, that's what we have again as we go back to Conference Carolinas as you've got a Francis Marion team traveling to Barton for a three-game Conference Carolinas set that we want to highlight. It's going to be in Wilson, North Carolina, at Nixon Field. And it's going to be quite a bit of fun. Last season, Francis Marion took two of three with every game in the series being decided by three or fewer runs, including a couple of one-run losses for Barton. So a team that just fell short in that series a season ago. Barton, 19-5 and five on the year, but they're 4-5 and five in conference play. Meanwhile, it's Francis Marion. They're 13-9, and nine, but they've started 6-3, and three, starting hot in conference play. Barton coming off a loss against Young Harris, and uh, they lost two of three in that series, while Francis Marion, they swept Cho in on the road. Uh, this competition gets a little more difficult for them this weekend here as these two teams collide in Francis Marion and Barton and Barton. Uh, when we talk about them, kind of like UNC Pembroke, uh, two teams that get on base quite a bit. They're fifth in the country and on base percentage, 467 on base as a team. And they're fifth in the country and strikeout to walk ratio with north of three in that category. And we've known and we've detailed it. That's such a key indicator when we talk about teams getting far in the postseason. And a team guy right now for Barton that's doing a lot of work is John McNamee. He's hitting 408, 22 runs driven in through 15 starts. Chase Waddell's hitting 396 with a team best 38 hits through 24 games. And then this team is led by a star, an All-American on both sides, Tanner Halverson, mainly known for what he can do on the hill, but he's hitting 304 on the year. He's also 5-0 on the mound with a 2.57 ERA, a .94 whip. At this point of the season, if you have a sub one whip as a starter, we're going to talk about you. And the most impressive stat that he has, Robert, he has 54 strikeouts and five walks on the season. Unbelievable what he's been able to do. He's going to have to go up against guys of the like of Zach Somerville, who's leading this Francis Marion offense right now with a 386 average, north of 1,000 on his OPS. He paces the squad with 24 RBI. And he has eight doubles on the year as well. So when we look at this matchup, we're obviously going to really circle the game where Tanner Halverson is pitching. He's 5-0 and oh on the year, like we mentioned. Went seven innings with one earned run last week against Young Harris. 
So he did it against a very good team, and he had 11 Ks. He'll try to continue his great season. Chase DeBrule, Josh Adams, Brennan Murphy, the potential starters that we look at based off last week for Francis Marion. How do they match up against Barton? That's going to be the big question in this one. Barton, a team that we think so highly of. They're already 19-5. and five. But again, can they get above 500 in conference play this weekend? Or does Francis Marion pick up another conference Carolinas win? This is going to be a really fun series to watch. Obviously, I think that when we talk about Division II baseball right now, there's a few names we think of when they tow the rubber that you, it's must-see TV. And Tanner Halverson's one of those guys. So you must tune into the Conference Carolinas Digital Network once again if you want to see one of the best arms in the country. And again, a lot of the best players in the country as we highlight two Conference Carolina series here this week. Yeah, I'd be very interested to see if Francis Marion pulls back Chaz DeBrule to throw against Halverson because Halverson's been known to throw that seven-inning game because the Conference Carolinas likes to play you know, a single game one day and then a doubleheader the next day, one of those two games being a seven-inning game. So be interesting to see that Tanner Halverson with his 11 strikeout performance, as you mentioned, Will, now is the leader in strikeouts in the country at 54. But the guy behind him is a guy you mentioned earlier, it's Reese Field. So this conference, Carolinas, has a lot of great pitching, and it's not going to get any better than this weekend as well. So as we kind of transition forward now, Talk less about pitching, but a lot about offense. And we're mm-hmm. going to go to the MIAA, and we're going to talk about this first series in the MIAA. And it's between two teams who have hit more home runs than any other team in the country. Yes, that's right. Number one and number two in the country in home runs. And that is Central Missouri and Washburn. As both of these teams have won at least five in a row. Washburn has won five straight. UCM has won nine in a row. UCM is sporting a 20 and 3 record. They're tied for first with a 9 and 1 record in the MIAA. Washburn is 13 and 8, but 8 and 2 in the MIAA, and they're tied for second. We got a three game set, and that will be on the MIAA network. Totally worth the stream, especially for a game like this weekend, as well as it's played in Topeka, Kansas at Valley Field. Washburn is the home team. We got a game on Friday at 4 o'clock. Central Time, Saturday, 2 p.m. Central, and Sunday, 1 p.m. Central. But let's talk about those offense. Like you said, UC, UCM, their tops in Division Two in batting average at 375, slugging 471, OPS of 1,127. Yes, 1,127 as a team. That's beyond impressive. And third in OBP at 471. They also boast the best fielding percentage in the country at 985. And they have the fourth most team stolen bases at 81. Chase Heath leads the conference in hitting at 475. He's third in OBP at 563. Leads the conference in both slugging and OPS. Over 1,000 slugging at 1,022. And OPS over 1,500. The Mules have six players with 20 or more RBIs. Ace Connor Wolf is a guy expected who performed well in game one of the series. He has a 2.31 ERA and a .66 whip in 35 innings. He's 5-0. and And the guy out of the bullpen that will do well is Grayson Sen, who has 17 strikeouts in just nine and two-thirds innings. Like I said, UCM has one of the p- most potent offenses you'll ever see this season, and they're on a historic pace there. They're on the pitching side. They're third in the MIAA with a 1.47 whip and third with a 21.2 strikeout rate. But we go flip over the Washburn. They're second again in home runs in the country. They're fifth in slugging with a 612, seventh in OPS over 1,000. And, well, that's led by Peyton McHarg. He's leading the comps with home runs in 10. He's third in the RBIs with 32, second in slugging at 873. Connor Scott is hitting 400. He's sixth in the MIAA. Cash J is third in slugging at 824 and third in home runs with eight. Kale Savage is ninth in the MIAA and OPS. Lots of like, a lot of high powered offenses going to play in Topeka this weekend, and we're excited for it. We're excited to see some shootouts offensively. Yeah, I mean, it's going to come down to pitching, you would think, right, with how good these both of these offenses are. It's funny, when we talk about stalwarts in Division II baseball, you think of Central Missouri, you think of Tampa. And when you look at the, what those two teams are doing this year, 
It's nothing short of remarkable. Both of those teams have continued to not just be the standard, but set new standards for what success looks like in Division II baseball. Washburn, though, a team you can't forget about, man. I mean, Central Missouri, Missouri Southern, Pitt State, Washburn, they're all four tops in the MIAA right now at either 9-1 and one or 8-2 and two in the conference. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. MIAA, man, it's as good as it gets right now. And we're going to transition, though, right now and go out west for a big CCAA series, Robert, as we're going to break down what a Sam Marcos team has done, as we've talked about them quite a bit here on DIVII's Breakdowns Weekly and also in the D2BI Magazine. They're 11-6. and six, They're 10-2 and two in CCAA play. They travel to Chico, though, and Chico 11-6. and six. They're 6-6 six and six through 12 conference games. It'll be at Chico again. These series typically are Friday, two Saturday, one Sunday, four game sets. And Chico, they just took three of four on the road last weekend against Stanislaus State. Well, San Marcos took three of four, an impressive three and four, three of four against San Bernardino. And that really turned our heads when they, their offense was able to win a series against a good San Bernardino team and a good San Bernardino pitching staff. So that turned heads. San Marcos has won three straight CCAA series. Right now, it looks like they're the team to beat within this conference Last played Chico back in 2022, they lost three of four in that series. But if they sweep this weekend, which will be a tough test on the road, they'll match their conference win total already from a season ago. This is a team that went 14 and 21 in conference play last year, and they're sitting at 10 and two right now, heading into yet another conference series, just their fourth. And it would give them four straight CCAA series wins to begin the year. That'd be pretty impressive. Chico, also a team that just won 13 conference games last year. They're already at six. So a couple of teams performing better than maybe they did a year ago, definitely than they did a year ago. And perhaps it makes us feel like this is a league that feels a little bit more wide open than maybe it was a year ago with what Monterey Bay and what San Bernardino did kind of run in the table last year. There's a couple of other teams we need to talk about, and that's why the San Marcos Chico State Series is something that we definitely want to watch. And when we look at what is in the works right now for San Marcos, here's the interesting thing for me, Robert. Their pitching staff hasn't been great. I mean, let's just be honest. Their their offense has, but they're eleven and six and ten and two in conference play. And it's not really because they're pitching. Now, Preston Kelly out of the pen has been great, and that's helped them win some close games. He's got three saves and nine appearances, and he's 2-0. and oh. And, yeah, he hasn't allowed a run yet this season in nine appearances. He's been great in the back end. Uh, but they're looking for guys like Connolly and Gleisner and Murphy and Bruno De Leon uh, to give them some length, to give them some length against Chico, who's got some good starting pitching, like Kevin Lyons, a guy we've talked about who's 3-1 and one on the year with a 2.7 ERA. He's got 22 Ks and just six walks on the year. Um, But it will be interesting. Obviously, they've had a little shakeup on the San Marcos side in their rotation trying to figure it out because they've got a 6.43 ERA as a team right now. Not necessarily great because all their starters' ERAs are above five as well. So they have had success in spite of their pitching, and they're hitting 316 as a team, which is easy to have success when you're doing that well offensively. When we talk about Chico, Again, I mentioned Kevin Lyons. He's going to have to go up against guys like Ethan Rivera when we talk about this San Marcos offense, who's led the way this season, hitting 426, but one of the best players in the conference right now. Four doubles, two home runs. Chico's Alexander Johnson is a guy to watch. He's kind of emerged as of late. Robert, four straight multi-hit games for him. He's hitting 438 on the season. A little bit smaller sample size for him just through 11 games, but he does indeed have five extra base hits. So this is a series, Robert, it feels like for me, if San Marcos takes another one, I think they might, especially if they sweep, they might garner a little bit of national attention. I mean, I know that their pitching has struggled, but if you can do that again, four straight CCAA series, You got to get some credit. And for Chico, how do they build off taking a big series last week at Santa Los State? So a lot to riding on this series for both of these teams. And that's why it's one we highlight here this week. Absolutely. And you highlight that off the, just the performance Cal State San Marcos did last week. And again, just the top of their order with Phoenix LeMay, Garrett Tunison and Luke Reese, all hitting above 300. Samay at 345. 
to Newsom at 364 as he was the conference player of the week. And like you mentioned, not even mentioning Ethan Rivera. So a lot of offense there in a league that's usually pitching, pitching heavy, but we'll be very interested to see how that plays out on the CCAA network. But we're going now back to the second MIAA series that you alluded to earlier, Will, and we're going to talk about the Missouri Southern and Pittsburgh State series as that's nothing short to be excited about because the, these are two teams that are also very, very high in offense, also very, very high in win streak, as both of these teams have won seven in a row, exactly seven in a row. Both of these teams last, or I guess both of these teams recently played Roger State, Pittsburgh State sweeping them over the weekend, and then uh, Missouri Southern playing them in the midweek contest. And so this will be in Pittsburgh, Kansas, Al Ortolani Field, one of the few places that will have instant replay in the MIAA, as if you've listened to D2 Baseball Insider and in our interview with Mike Racy, he mentioned some of the pilot program of replay. But in terms of offenses, both of these teams are top 25 in the country in all four of batting average, on-base percentage, slugging, and OPS. Missouri Southern is best in slugging and OPS. They're both 11th in those categories. Pittsburgh State is 5th in slugging and 7th in OPS. In a little bit, we're going to talk about the road team. They're currently number 5 in the country again, 21-4. and four. Like I mentioned, 9-1 and one in the MIAA. They're tied with uh, Central Missouri. Pittsburgh State is 8-2 and two in the MIAA, tied with Washburn. But Missouri Southern is second in the country in Division II in RBIs with 227. Henry Kuziak recently breaking the hits and total base records at the school. He's third in the MIAA in hitting, third in OBP, 548, fourth in slugging at 806, second in OPS with a 1354 figure, and second in RBI. And that's not mentioning some of the teammates. Drew Townsend leads the MIAA in OBP at 575. And his 10th in OPS at 1,175. Will Doherty leads the MIAA in RBIs with 36. And, of course, we have to talk about that rotation. Most importantly, Cole Gaiman, who's 5-0 and with a 1.59 ERA, second in the MIAA, and he's first in batting average against at a 144 figure, and third in strikeouts at 35. But He'll go up against what we expect to see a matchup of unbeatens. Tanner Leslie on the flip side for Pitt State. He's 4-0 with a 4.66 ERA in 29 series. So matchup between unbeatens, hopefully we see on Friday as that first game will start at 3 p.m. Central time on Friday, 2 p.m. Saturday, and noon on Sunday, all Central time, like I mentioned. But the grad transfer from Tarleton State, Dylan Kurahasi Choi Fu is currently 10th in the conference and hitting at 386. Nixon Brannon, 4th in OPS at 1291. He's tied for 5th with 7 home runs and 5th in slugging at 781. We also got to talk about Cade Clemens, who's a absolute all great all-around player. He's 10th in the MIAA in slugging at 722. Carson Coffey is 7th in D2 in RBIs with 29. So, or excuse me, 7th in the in the conference in 20 with 29. And the interesting part about this is, you know, both of these teams, like, like I mentioned, top 25 offenses, but then you have Missouri Southern's third in the conference with a 464 ERA, top 25 in the country with strikeout rate at 23.9%. Pittsburgh State's second in the conference in MIAA and ERA, 434. They're 10th in the country in WHIP at 1.27. And both of these teams are top 25 in the country and fielding percentage. So you might see a lot of well-roundedness in this series, and we're excited for it. Again, two teams that have strengths all across the diamond uh, on both sides of the ball, and that's why we're picking it as a series to watch. 100%. I mean, I'm looking forward to that matchup with Tanner Leslie and Cole Gaiman, as we might expect that might be the case, because 
Uh, both of those guys have thrown the ball well this year, game and especially as of late. But Tanner Leslie's coming off a, a seven-inning shutout that he spun against Roger State. I mean, he threw the ball well. His ERA is a little bit deceiving. He got blown up in a start against Northwest Missouri State where he allowed eight earned runs. But other than that, I mean, four of his six starts have been quality going up against some pretty good teams. And I- I'm looking forward to that and gaming because when you talk about, you know, some really, really good offenses, Robert. Um, well, you got to have some good pitching. So, and again, two teams that have momentum, like you mentioned. I mean, Missouri Southern, a team we think very highly of, ranked fifth in the country from our standards. Pittsburgh State, a team that's receiving votes. So, when we look Friday, Saturday, Sunday for a great three game set in MIAA action at Pittsburgh, I mean, I think in Pittsburgh, Kansas, if the Gorillas could do something remarkable here, that would be fun to watch. Two unbelievable electrifying offenses. It's funny you mentioned those four MIAA teams, all the top battling each other this week here with Central Missouri, Washburn, and then Pitt State, and now Missouri Southern. The top four upper echelon teams in this conference all lay it on the line this weekend. And two just fantastic, unbelievable MIAA series, and it could shake up a lot of things here in the MIAA this weekend. So I'm really, really excited for it. You better lock in tomorrow afternoon for a Leslie Gaiman matchup, as we may expect. But, man, other than that, Robert, I'm just uh, – that, that got to that's got to get you excited. The MIAA's offense has just been nothing short of remarkable this year with all the bombs they've hit. And, and, and the fact that Carson Coffey nearly has 30 RBIs and that's not leading the conference just kind of shows you. I mean, that, that's leading a lot of leagues right now. And what did you say, seventh? I mean, it just shows that this is just a, a really, really great league. Enough said about that, though. The MIAA had a couple of great series to watch. We already mentioned a couple of the great Conference Carolina series that we hope you watch. Now we're going to transition over to the Great Lakes Valley Conference for a series to watch. It's going to be the Quincy University Hawks, who are 6-9. and nine. However, they got a Great Lakes Valley Conference series victory Last weekend, going up against Maryville, they pay a visit to St. Louis, Missouri, and go up against a Maryville team that's 11-5 and right now, and they had a sweep of Upper Iowa last weekend to start 4-0 in Great Lakes Valley Conference play, and they're now receiving votes in our polls, and Quincy, a team that we had ranked to begin the season, they quickly dropped out after an 0-7 start, uncharacteristic slow start for them, but after starting 0-7, they've won each of their last two weekends, However, like we mentioned, Maryville really impressed taking care of business against Upper Iowa, and it was really highlighted by Jack Zebig. Jack Zebig had such a big weekend last weekend, and last weekend kind of showed you how good of a player he can be, but this whole season has been the Jack Zebig show right now for Maryville. He's hitting 393, leading the way for this offense that has proven commodities, all American commodities like Aaliyah Stevens and Michael Gould, who aren't really spraying the ball around the park like you maybe would expect, but it's still a Maryville team that's hitting around 330 as a team. And they've got a rotation that is really impressive. I mean, intrigued to see what they do this weekend, Robert, because you know you can pencil in Jacob Crager game one. I mean, that's a given. Ben Gregory game two, that feels like it's a given. Ben Prywich, who was a big-time reliever for them last weekend, he's been the game three guy for them. Those three are solidified, but what they did last week is they get a big guy coming out of the pen for him last year, only made a couple of starts, had to start a big game in a regional last year, and they start Noah Aris, first start of the year for him. And what did he do? Well, he's a guy who gives you, you know, 87, 88 with some good run on a sink or two-seamer. And, and to have that guy as your fourth starter makes me feel confident that this Maryville Saints pitching staff and pitching rotation in particular is the best in this Great Lakes Valley Conference. But they'll have to go up against some pretty good guys at the plate, like an Austin Simpson, who has five homers, four doubles, 12 RBIs, and he is just raking this year, hitting above 450. And then a freshman, David Broughton, who's hitting 379 on the year with an OPS north of 1,000. Those two guys have carried the load for Quincy. And the thing for Quincy right now, we highlight this series. You might think, oh, a 6-9 and nine Quincy team, why do you highlight it? Well, both of these two teams are, for one, traditional powers within the Midwest region. And for Quincy, they just won a Great Lakes Valley Conference Series. Maryville had a sweep. So these two teams are trying to stay. I know it's just the second weekend in conference play, but these two teams are trying to stay atop the conference. And for two teams that 
a really strong Midwest regional candidates. It feels like every year for the past couple of years, it's something you really want to highlight. Maryville lost a series at Quincy last year, but they were able to take a game at Quincy, which only four teams, they only lost four times at QU Stadium in total a season ago. And for them, it starts with Griffin Kern. He does great work, Robert, on the mound. He's their ace. But for me right now, other guys have to step up for this Quincy pitching staff if they want to continue to have success in GLBC play like they did last weekend. And it was kind of surprising to me, that, honestly, that they took that series with the fact that they only got two outs from their Game 3 and Game 4 starters combined, and they allowed a total of 11 runs. Not very good, but impressive that they were able to get the series. It shows that this offense is capable. This bullpen can also be capable. You know, Matt Schizzle is always great with getting those pieces in the pen and also just working with pitchers. That's a big part of his background and really confident that with Kern and Essien and with the pieces to follow, they'll do great work. But I'm really high on Pat Evers' squad and what they can do. So that's why it's a primetime collision battle in St. Louis, Missouri for some Great Lakes Valley Conference play. And yet again, another series that we're thrilled to highlight here today. Absolutely. Well, you know, Quincy has been to a regional every year since 2015. Big reason why it's getting highlighted again, Maryville looking like a team that might run the GLVC, if not run the Midwest region, but there's a lot of tough opponents there in the Midwest region, but we're excited for it. We're going to pay attention to it, but we're also going to move on and move to the next conference. And we're going to go to the, Keach Belt Conference, and we're going to talk about Georgia Southwestern, currently ranked 16th in our poll, 18 and 5, and they're 4 and 2 in conference play. They're tied for second against another team that's tied for second with a 4 and 2 record, and that's Georgia College. They're 13 and 10 overall on the season. But what makes it very interesting is in, in Milledgeville, Georgia, both of these teams have won at least four in a row. Georgia College has won four in a row. Georgia Southwestern, five in a row. And this will be a Saturday doubleheader at 1 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Eastern and a Sunday single game at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can see this on the Peach Belt Sports Network. Really excited to see this because it's it's a offense, a team with a high offense, a team with a great pitching staff, and we'll see how it plays out. But Georgia Southwestern, they're 17th in the country in batting average at 333, seventh with a 459 team on base percentage. That's really impressive. They get on base at such a high level. Georgia College is second in the conference at a 311 batting average. They're second in conference with 421 on base percentage and third in the conference in slugging and OPS. As some, some guys to highlight for Georgia Southwestern, Miles Hartsfield has a 508 OBP, Corey Lee 500 OP, OBP, Jake Blinstrup 492, Paul Hageman, 491. Four guys that get out on base at a high level. And the big reason why this Georgia Southwestern team has a 459 OBP. But I want to talk about pitching. As a staff, Georgia Southwestern, 337 ERA, 1.25 whip, 27 and a half strikeout percentage. Top 10 in the Division II in all three. So really excited to see that. And excited to see one of the best one, two, three punches you'll ever see is Nick McCollum has a 1.22 ERA. 49 strikeouts. He leads the conference in both of those things. Nick McCollum, top 10 nationally in strikeouts in 37 innings. Reginaldo Eusen has a 2.64 ERA, and he has 45 strikeouts, third in the conference in strikeouts, sixth in the ERA, also in the top 20 nationally in strikeouts. He's 3-0 and with a, in 30 and two-thirds innings. And then Andrew Geiger, their Sunday guy, or their game three guy, I should say, a 2.29 ERA with 39 strikeouts. He's fifth in the conference in strikeouts and fourth in ERA. He's 3-0 and in 35 and a third innings. And, well, they got to face some really good batters because you got Matthew Mabane out for Georgia College. He's hitting 360, 439 OBP, 740 slugging as he's fourth in the conference in slugging, fifth in OPS. He's tied fifth in RBIs with 28, and he's also top 10 in in the country and home runs with 10. And that also includes Brandon Bellflower, who has a slash line of 421, 518, and 642. He's fourth in hitting, eighth in slugging, and sixth in OPS. And one one pitcher to highlight for Georgia College is John Raines. He's fourth in the conference in strikeouts with 40, as he has a 3-1 record in 25 innings with a 3.60 ERA. So 
you know, can Georgia Southwestern has a little bit of struggles playing on the road. Can Georgia College take them at home or can Georgia Southwestern turn the tide with a little bit of their road struggles at home? Yeah, it'll be fun to see, man. I mean, Nick McCollum's just been so good this year, and, and he's been a treat to watch for Division II baseball fans. We had the pleasure of speaking with him earlier this year with him being National Pitcher of the Week, uh, rated by us here at DIVII and D2 Baseball Insider. But yeah, Robert, I mean, when you look at that Peach Bell Conference, I mean, North Georgia's been hot. They've been catching our eye, but Georgia Southwestern's a team we've liked this year. Obviously, you have a Columbus State power. And then this Georgia College and State University team, that's 4-2 and two in conference play. This is a collide between two teams at 4-2 and two that have an opportunity to continue to separate themselves atop this league with this critical, critical series. Uh, really great job breaking that down. Georgia Southwestern's rotation, though, uh, that's going to be a bear to deal with. And we'll see how... Georgia College and State cannot ultimately try to counter that. That's going to be fun to see. And again, fun baseball that you can watch. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but free of charge on that Peach Belt Network, right? Absolutely free of charge. Absolutely. And another thing that is just free of charge, we'll tell you all about it right now. It's the universe. It's, it's just an impressive team, Robert. That's all I could say. And when I say impressive team, they say, man, Will, all these teams are impressive. Well, no team is more impressive right now than Tampa. They're 20 and 1 on the year. They're 3 and 0 in Sunshine State Conference play, and that's where we move right now to the Sunshine State Conference where the number 1 ranked team in the land pays a visit to Embry-Riddle in a big Sunshine State Conference showdown. Embry-Riddle's 13 and 6. They're 2 and 1 in Sunshine State Conference play in Tampa. They're a team that has swept Embry-Riddle in each of the last two seasons, but the Eagles are hot. They've won five in a row, and their one Sunshine State Conference series win came earlier this year at Rollins. Shows their ability to be good traditional powers in this league, and they'll try to do it again here this weekend. Tampa, though, they're coming off another dominant weekend, man. <laughs> it's just impressive what they've continued to do. They swept Lenore Ryan after dropping their first game of the season um, in the middle of the week last week against Seton Hill, that was last Monday, another nationally ranked team that they went up against and just lost by a run, Robert, 6-5 to five in that game. But for Embry-Riddle, man, it's a, it, I don't know if you can get a tougher stretch than they have right now. So they've got Tampa this week. They've got St. Leo next week. You're going up against two of the best teams in the nation in back-to-back -back weeks. What can Embry-Riddle do? It's a massive opportunity for them. This will be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, first game, 6 p.m. Eastern time on Friday night. And when we look at Tampa, it's Skylar Gonzalez who has turned our head. National Pitcher of the Year front runner right now. He's 6-0 and with a .5 ERA, absolutely one of the best arms of the nation. And then Mike Valdez is hot, reigning D2BI National Hitter of the Week. But he has been hitting all year long, hitting 464 to lead this team for a Tampa offense that not just is number one in the country. Here's why they're number one in the country. Because they're number one in the nation in scoring, number one in the nation in ERA, number one in the nation in getting on base. So they score the most runs and allow the fewest runs. Robert, I know we've detailed it. Their run differential is unbelievable. They're playing at a way that we've never seen before. We've never seen this before in our time covering D2 baseball and even diving deep in the archives saying, dude, what the heck is going on with this Tampa team? They're just blowing the doors off of teams. Emory Riddle's a team that does have that round-the-base path ability with their offense. They have 14 triples on the year through 19 games. That's second in the country and triples per game just behind a love it Christian team. But when we look at this Tampa team, Skyler Gonzalez, Alex Caney, that is a rotation right there in itself. Jake Stipp, their game three starter. All their all their starters have a sub two five ERA. Gonzalez at point five eight. Caney at five and zero at a two four eight. So those two guys are eleven and zero combined. Stipp is one and zero with a one four six ERA. 
Uh, for Embry Riddle, Dylan Moran, it will probably throw that first game for them. They've had a handful of different guys start games this year. Five different guys have got to start, obviously. We're playing a ton of midweeks. That happens as well. But um, it's a massive opportunity for Embry Riddle these next two weeks. And for Tampa, they try to stay hot because they have been hot. And, and at this point, right, you get hot for a week, right? I don't even know if hot is the right word. They're just darn good, and they're excellent, and they'll try to continue that. Absolutely. Well, they are excellent. They'll try to continue that. Like you mentioned earlier, that run differential currently at plus 183. If they keep going on their pace of beating their opponents by, on average, nine and a half runs, they'll have a plus differential of over 500, Will. And that has never been happening. Have has happened before in Division Two baseball as far back as we could go, where there were actual statistics available for runs scored and runs allowed by team. But yeah, I mean it'd be interesting to see how that goes. But you know, Embry Riddle themselves is a very tough team. Like you mentioned, they did take a series against Rollins, Chase Bruno, Camden Traficante, two guys in the middle of the field at second base and shortstop respectively guys who can do it on both sides both hitting well for Embry Riddle so be very interested to see how that pans out for Embry Riddle against Tampa and how Tampa may continue but we will continue now to our last series and our last series will be on my end will be Two teams that are atop the South Atlantic Conference, the SAC, and that is Lincoln Memorial and Wingate. Wingate traveling to Lincoln Memorial. And what is interesting about the parallels between these two teams is both of these teams had a midweek loss. And guess what? Both of those teams that had the midweek loss, too, are playing each other this weekend as Wingate lost to UNC Pembroke and Lincoln Memorial lost to North Greenville. So they're both playing each other this weekend, but they obviously want to get back off the schneid there, get into conference play, and see which one of the two is at the top. And like I mentioned before, they are number one and number two in the conference, where Wingate is currently 14 and 8, 7 and 2 in the SAC, and Lincoln Memorial 16 and 7 and 8 and 4 in the SAC. Played at Lamar and Enfield. We'll see a Saturday doubleheader starting at 3 p.m. Eastern and a Sunday single game at 1 p.m. Eastern. Subscribe to Flow Sports. Flow Baseball TV is where we'll care sack games to watch this series. But when we want to talk about offense, Lincoln Memorial is leading the entire sack in all three of these categories, plus OPS, 321 batting average, 428 OBP, 538 slugging, and, well, it's because it's led by junior Carson Bowles. He's vying for sack player of the year contention through 86 at bats. He's hitting 465, 584, and 779. That's second in the country, or excuse me, second in the conference in batting average, first in both on base percentage and slugging, which makes him first in OPS. He's third in the conference in RBI with 28. He also has 10 stolen bases. Teammates Cameron Bowen and Caston Harvey are amongst the top in RBI as well with 30 and 27, respectively. The rail splitters have six hitters above 300. Christian Pensack is fresh off a conference pitcher of the week selection. He went seven shutout last weekend with seven strikeouts. Can he replicate that success? And speaking of success, Wingate, they're right behind Lincoln Memorial in slugging and OPS is their slugging is a 484 number, and their OPS is a tad bit above 800, nearly into the 900 territory. As Cam Harris, he's currently 10th in the country and hitting at 494, currently with a five-game hitting streak. Sean Barnett leads the conference in RBIs with 32. He's also second in home runs with eight and second in slugging at 711. The Bulldogs sport the Second best ERA in the conference at 449. That's led by Keelan Hoover, who is 4 0 with a 2.53 ERA in six starts. But we also got to talk about the bullpen, Dylan Story. Eight appearances, 21 in the third innings. He has a 0.42 ERA. I'm very interested to see how this plays out. Lincoln Memorial, and then defense as both of the teams perform at a high level. Lincoln Memorial is 21st in the country with a 975 fielding percentage, and Wingate is third in the conference with a 969 fielding percentage. So 
battle of the top of the sack, and we'll see if, you know, by season's end, they remain. Whoever wins the series remains at the top of the South Atlantic Conference. Yeah, it's going to be a really good battle between the two teams at the top. I really can't wait for that one. A critical series for both of these teams uh, for, for regional, for conference tournament seeding, and, and, and really, really two quality teams going at it. Speaking of that, and teams at the top of the league, we break down yet another series in our final series to break down West Texas A&M and Texas Permian Basin battling in a Lone Star Conference series. Robert, this will be in Odessa, Texas at Roden Field, and it's going to be Friday to Saturday, one Sunday in a four-game set. And when we talk about UT Permian Basin, I mean, they caught my attention, Robert, early in the year. They started the year off taking three of four from St. Mary's. They took three of four from Lubbock Christian. Then they split with Angelo, and you thought, man, this is a team, and then you look at it now, Angelo and Lubbock toward the top of this league, along with West Texas A&M, who is at the top of this league and is the opponent of UT Permian Basin in this particular weekend. Okay, they split versus Angelo, take a series from Lubbock. They haven't played as well as of late. They just dropped a series two weeks ago to Texas A&M International, dropped one against Kingsville the week before that. And then last week, they were able to split a series against St. Edwards. So now getting to host Wex Texas A&M, a team that's first right now in the Lone Star Conference. They're 15-5 and five in Lone Star Conference play. Haven't played the toughest of teams in Lone Star Conference play action yet, but this will be a tough one against UT Permian Basin. We have West Texas A&M ranked 20th in the country right now. UTPB 12-12 12 and 12 in Lone Star Conference action. For West Texas A&M, a reason why they've had a lot of success, well, they've hit 330 as a team right now. That They're 20th in batting average and 4th in the Lone Star in slugging and OPS, 20th in the country in batting average. Well, UTPB hitting 293 as a team, um, and we'll see if they're going to be able to go up against some good arms of West Texas A&M who've shown good stuff. They're second in the conference right now and strikeout percentage. And when you talk about West Texas A&M, it's about the 3-4 punch in the lineup that's been a boon for the 20th best offense in hitting. Three-hole Ryan Camacho is hitting 456, which is second in the conference, fourth with a 531 OBP. And then the four-hole Dylan Vesperman is eighth in the conference in hitting at 403, seventh in slugging, ninth in OPS, and tied for a team lead with 22 RBI. So those two have really helped it out. And then the Bluffs bullpen has really been a lot of arms that just have good stuff coming out of the pen that can strike you out. And you need that in four game sets and Lone Star Conference action. And Chase Weaver striking guys out north of 40%. A freshman lefty has just got an unbelievable stuff, but he was inserted into the rotation last week, making his first start. He's got five appearances and now one start of the season. Reese Miller, Matt Whitney are two arms out of the pen who've got a K percentage as well above 30%. So the arms out of the back end of this pen do some really good stuff. While UTPB, the sophomore, leads the offense for them, Mason Hamlin. It leads the team in average OBP slugging and stolen bases. He's 15 of 18, which is most in the Lone Star Conference right now. Austin Hall, a guy who's third in the conference for this UTBB team in runs driven in. So this will be a fun series. Again, like I mentioned, when you look at this, he has 28 runs driven on the year Austin Hall does. But when you look at this series, it's just who's going to knock West Texas A&M off? You know, they're first in the league right above Lubbock and Angelo, who have a primetime matchup coming up next week. Lubbock's a hot team. Angelo's a hot team. They found their groove, but can West Texas A&M stay on top going up against a quality team of the Falcons of UTPB? That's going to be a fun Lone Star Conference series to watch, especially with UTPB being the host in this series. I'm excited for it, Robert. And, and the Lone Star Conference has just been wild this year with everybody beating up on each other in these four-game sets. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned it. Everybody's beating up each other. There's not really a clear front runner. I know Lubbock Christian, you know, they're on a big nine game streak. We'll mention them in a minute. But you mentioned earlier to you, UTPB took three or four against them, but then they dropped three or four this past weekend. And West Texas A&M, they look like a good team, but I don't know if they're, they're really a cream of the crop type team in the Lone Star. And we'll see how that plays out this weekend. But you know, speaking of how stuff plays out this weekend, we'll mention some other series that will be playing out this weekend and what something we're excited for. And 
we'll talk about two non-conference series that we want to highlight this weekend. And we have to start again with Grand Valley is going to Seton Hill. Grand Valley 8-5. and five. Seton Hill currently ranked number 15 in our polls. They're in a non-conference series that's played Friday and Saturday. Another series that's important to watch is Regis, the Shovel Boys, and Lubbock Christian at 17-7, and seven, winning nine in a row. That series was originally scheduled to be in Denver, Colorado, but with snow over the weekend in Denver, that was moved to Lubbock, Texas, so it will be a two-game series um, in that series. So excited to look at those. You know, Seton Hill is the only team to take down Tampa in that Seton Hill Grand Valley series. Regis and Lubbock. Regis is one of the teams to beat Augustana twice in a series, and Augustana is looking like a great team. So kudos to them, Regis, uh, having being able to beat Augustana twice. And then, like I mentioned, Lubbock Christian winners of nine in a row. Yeah, two really good non-conference matchups for Grand Valley, a team that started the year really strong. They had that series win over Indy, but in Florida, they struggled in the rust mat. They just went, what, two and four last week in the rust mat, and it doesn't get easier for them because they've got Seton Hill on the road this week, and Seton Hill, like we mentioned, so darn good. And then for Lubbock, can they stay hot against a Regis team uh, that they've They've played a really tough schedule, and they've held their own. So both of those non-conference battles got to be fun. Key to note that that Lubbock just two games uh, because of the fact that the Lone Star only allows two non-conference games, and then Grand Valley and Seton Hill, that's going to be a three-game set in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and some other series we want to talk about too. We're going to go to the MIAA. Again, another another series where teams are winning a lot of baseball games. We have Fort Hayes State. They're traveling to Central Oklahoma, Fort Hayes State at 18 and 6. Central Oklahoma at 19 and 5. Central Oklahoma has won four in a row. Fort Hayes State six in a row. And really interesting to see that Fort Hayes State's bullpen's been pitching really well. They have a .93 ERA and a .98 whip out of the bullpen during this six-game winning streak. Be interesting to see how they perform against Central Oklahoma and some of their bats. In, in that series, we're also Lander and Columbus State. Columbus State, you know, struggled a little bit, but they've won 11 the last of their 13. They're four and two in the conference. They're playing Lander, who's really, really hit well a lot there, and really excited for that. And then the last one I'll mention as well is the SIAC, number one and number two in conference play between Albany State and Spring Hill. It's at Albany State. They're ten and two in conference play. Spring Hill is eleven one in conference play. So, a battle of top teams in the SIAC. Yeah, another, uh, another few more to watch out out of the MEC. A couple of good ones, just double headers that you have with that conference format. Charleston and Wheeling going at it. Two teams, top of the North, top of the South, going at it. And then Concord and Frostburg, two teams that were expected to be very good in this conference, playing each other in a double header this weekend as well. Montevallo and Mississippi College, also another Gulf South, Gulf South conference battle that I'm looking forward to. And then UIS and William Jewell. That's going to be fun one to look at. UIS split last week. Jewell lost three or four to Quincy, but two teams that have high hopes and two teams that have really good offenses as well. And the last one staying in the Midwest region for me, GMAC has Ohio, Dominican, and Walsh. You just think about Ashland in this conference. Those two teams both above 500, and that should be a pivotal battle as well within the great Midwest Athletic Conference. Absolutely, Will. And the, the three I'll wrap up on are Pace and Adelphi as the best staff in the NE10 in Pace 2.2. 2. 8-2 E team ERA against the second best conference in hitting with Adelphi at 315. That'll be interesting to watch. Shippensburg, a team that's eight and six, two and two in PSAC play, goes to Westchester, or that'll be a four-game set where they split home and home series with double headers. Westchester 10-1, 3-1 in the PSAC. Two teams, Westchester doing very well. Shippensburg made the regional last year. Interesting to see that. And then teams that you know, we were very highly on. They haven't performed as well, but, you know, they play in the Sunshine State Conference, and that's Lynn currently at 13-9 and nine, and Rollins at 11-8, and eight, both 3-3 three and three in conference, and that will be at Alphonse Stadium in Winter Park, Florida.